Good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining us in this session. Um, this is a collaborative session organized by IGF Brazil, IGF Panama, and youth like IGF. Uh, please feel free to come closer if you, if you want, especially you around there. Uh, the idea is that we have um, a very dynamic debate. Uh, we selected three topics related to data protection to discuss today. And I will uh, start immediately so we have uh, enough time for discussion and questions in the end. Well, my name is Jamila Venturini. I'm part of the Internet Steering Committee advisory team. And um, this workshop, as I said, was co-organized by three uh, nat national or regional IGFs, Brazilian IGF, Panama IGF, and Youth, youth Luck IGF. Um, the idea is to promote a dialogue and exchange of experiences and best practices regarding particular topics on data protection. Our first round of intervention will focus on government access to data, and we will start with Lia Hernandez, who is the executive director of IPANDETEC, and she represents the Panama I IGF. Thank you, Lia, for, for joining us and for all the help in the organization of this session. Um, you have seven minutes. Uh, good morning, my name is Lia Hernandez. I am from the Panamanian organization IPANDETEC, and I'm also from the IGF Panama. We work with digital rights, and I have to talk about the data protection legislation in Panama City. Um, my organization is mainly working on data protection issues. Panama has not a data protection law, but the government of Panama cannot have access to the data unless prior judi judicial authoris authorization. Unlike other countries where the communications can be accessed by the government, for example, the last uh, month in Chile, the Congress don't accept to approve the decret SPIA that, that allowed that the government keep in our in their registers for at least two hours information of the authority of this population in Chile. Um, um, but in telecommunication matter we have a lot of a lot of law that talk about the ac uh, data access in our legislation. But in Panama we only the government only can keep the information of data of the people for only six months, and after this time, the government council or raise all information about us. Also, currently, we have a, a, a law project in the Congress. This project uh, is about the, the possibility of register the SIM of cell phones because uh, currently in Panama, when you buy a SIM of cell phone, you don't have to register your name or all information about you. But currently in the Congress, there's a lot of projects that allow to the government or like an obligation to the, to the communication companies register uh, some information about the, the, the people as the name, the address, uh, the ID numbers, and is in the third debate in the Congress, and we are working in our organization to don't allow this uh, law because we think that uh, this law is against the mainly uh, constitutional guarantees in the Panamanians, uh, legislation as the privacy or data protection. So we don't have a lot of topics or issues about data protection. We don't have a, like, a lot of problems like in other countries with the information of the population, but I think that don't have a, properly a law about this topic is like a problem for the for the society because we don't have this, the, the no solution or the no tools to defend our digital rights. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. 
Thank you also for commenting the status of the discussion, the Congress discussion on the data protection law and the different bills that are emerging. I would like now to introduce you to Marian Fernandez Perez, who is a senior policy advisor at the European Digital Rights, EDRI, and she will comment the European context and the challenges for cross-border access to data. Marian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm here representing 35 associations that belong uh, to EDRI. Uh, we're based in Brussels, but our members are represented in 19 European countries and also have representation uh, internationally. Um, when it comes to government access to data, one can talk about many different aspects, but as uh, Jamila asked me to talk only about cross-border access to data, I will make some general uh, remarks uh, regarding the trends that we're seeing in Europe. Uh, first, the first point I want to make is that uh, when we talk about cross-border access to data, um, we should talk about data and not electronic evidence or e-evidence. In a context of criminal investigations and government access to data, um, this, uh, the term of e-evidence would not be appropriate. Why? Because if you, um, just because you access data, this won't necessarily mean that the data will constitute electronic evidence before a court, or that even this evidence will uh, be valid before a court. So we should change the discourse and talk about cross-border access to data instead of just uh, electronic evidence. And uh, according to EU rules on data protection and privacy, of communications, regardless of the type of personal data, involved these all deserve the same protection. So whatever categorization that either uh, the European Commission in its proposal in January or uh, in the um, Council of Europe discussions, the EU should uh, defend the same protection for all types of personal data. The second point I want to make is that um, there is a false assumption that uh, because criminals are increasingly using the internet and technology, um, law enforcement uh, authorities are facing um, many obstacles for effective uh, criminal investigations. Of course, there are some legitimate concerns, but however, the digital area, uh, we're leaving more and more digital traces, and therefore information society services both create new investigative possibilities as well as obstacles. Uh, this is reflected, for example, in the directive um, that is called the EU uh, Policy Directive on Data Protection. Um, and in case uh, some um, access to content data, for example, is made difficult, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Privacy clearly stated that metadata is at least as revealing of a person's individual activity as the actual content of a conversation. As a result, it's clear that we live in a golden age of, for law enforcement authorities when it comes to collecting electronic information. The other thing I want to um, talk about is uh, the MLAT reform versus um, mechanisms of direct cooperation with service providers. We see that there is a trend to, instead of reforming at mutual legal um, assistance treaties, uh, there's to be, uh, there seems to be an assumption that uh, we have lost um, tr uh, hope on reforming it and uh, think that direct cooperation with companies will solve all the problems. Um, in the case of the Commission and the European Union, for example, they outlined uh, very uh, important practical solutions, such as creating a global and secure uh, online uh, portal, a better training for law enforcement authorities on how to use MLAT, uh, simplification <coughs> and a standardization of forms, creating points of contact, and so on. These uh, measures are important, but obviously uh, there needs to be a willingness to actually um, uh, put this into practice. And so, um, uh, from a uh, European data rights perspective, we encourage uh, not only the European Union, but any other parties that are considering to uh, update or uh, have a framework on cross-border access to data, that uh, they focus on improving the MLATs. This could first start in the case of the European Union by first assessing the implementation of the uh, case law, such as the Digital Rights Ireland case, which uh, ruled that the data retention directive in Europe was illegal according to EU law. This could also start with efficiency, uh, attacking the efficiency and implementation of the current European investigation order, including its impacts on fundamental rights. This could also look at the complementary nature of the EU and national frameworks and the forthcoming second protocol um, to the Cybercrime Convention, among others. What we need is to ensure a cooperation with EU member states, in the case of the EU, and any adopted text uh, should be unequivocally in line with case law uh, of the Court of Justice of the European Union. 
it's in everybody's interest to make sure that any instrument would pass the core test. If we follow the case law on data retention, we see that uh, despite all the recommendations and constructive criticisms that NGOs like mine and um, also um, our members have made, have, have not been taken into account. And it has to be subject to litigation to actually ensure that um, the fundamental rights concerns we have presented are actually taken on board. So it is very important that policymakers take this into account very seriously. We also should need uh, to advocate against any proposal that would lower the current standards of protection for human rights, such as the recent bill from the US Department of Justice in the, uh, in the US. We also need to ensure that no text is adopted that would have the effect of lowering or circumventing high European standards of protection, including high guarantees of protection for the, mental, for the fundamental rights, privacy, data protection, and due process. In the case of the Council of Europe discussions, uh, as uh, Leah presented a, a good example where there are some countries that actually do not have the framework that we have in Europe, so the safeguards become even more important when we talk about the Council of Europe discussions. And finally, um, a very important point is also um, on transparency. We need to, uh, that any process is transparent and inclusive, and we also need safeguards. Um, EDRI supports the necessi necessary and proportionate principles uh, for both the EU discussions and the Council of Europe discussions. And these include uh, principles uh, that should be respected, such as the principle of legality, judicial authorization uh, prior to making any requests uh, for data. Uh, also, uh, double criminality and seriousness of the, the, the offense, the principle of necessity, um, due process, user notification by default and effective remedies, public oversight uh, that is effective and accountable, integrity of communications and systems um, uh, to be respected, safeguards for international cooperation, and safeguards also against illegitimate access, including but not limited to uh, derogations that would uh, allow uh, the parties that are faced with government um, access requests to say actually your request, um, you know, for example, does not comply with the safeguards that are in the, law, in the law, and so therefore we cannot grant you this and then try to find a way to actually cooperate between authorities uh, and also between authorities and companies to make sure that um, our rights and freedoms are not undermined. Um, and finally, I said finally already, but uh, just uh, uh, just last remark. We also see a trend on uh, government hacking uh, in the European Union context. Instead of talking about it, uh, they are talking about remote access or direct access to e-evidence through an information system without any intermediary. So we think that uh, we should be um, more honest about what we are talking about here, and governments conducting these activities should be mindful of best practices and set up a clear, coordinated vulnerability disclosure system and commit not to stop piling flaws for future use. And that's why, um, since we see that um, certain safeguards have not been implemented, uh, we call for a presumptive ban on government hacking. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. This was an excellent overview of several uh, points related to government access to data. Thank you for highlighting all the concerns regarding criminal investigations also. I believe there are different types of uh, uh, mechanisms for government to have access to data, and uh, uh, several countries are facing serious uh, uh, threats, I would say, and uh, attempts to reform legislation to fragilize uh, safeguards that are already in place. So it was uh, very interesting. Thank you for that. And thank you also for, for highlighting the recommendations from the European Civil Society for MLAT reform and other topics. Uh, we will now move to the segment on uh, data retention. And I will introduce you to Bruno Bioni, who is the legal advisor at the Brazilian Network Information Center. And he will bring some thoughts from the Brazilian IGF and some, some uh, history of the data retention discussion in Brazil. So good morning or good afternoon for everyone. Thanks for having me. As Jamila has said, I'm Bruno Bioni. I'm a legal advisor at NIC.br, but today I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Uh, as taking like the, the title of the session as a guide, near eyes learning from the national and the regional IGF initiatives, exchanging experience and insights on data retention, government access to data, and the data literacy, I will map how one of these three topics 
data retention specifically has taken place in the seven editions of the Brazilian Internet Governance Forum. Just to put all of us in the same page, uh, since 2001 annually, and it could not be different, the Brazilian IGF has been an uh, arena for the discussion of Internet governance issues. For this reason, it, it can be considered as a thermometer of the policy debate. So my goal today is to rebuild the data rotation demand along these last seven years, diving deeply into the reports of the Brazilian IGF. This might be useful to understand what is the evolution and the current status of data retention discussion in Brazil, and most important, showing that near rise are available research source to be explored in order to understand the history of internet regulation process, and ultimately, this is an uh, exercise that aims at revealing the importance of near rise as an uh, archive for such purpose. And by doing that, it is possible to identify three phases of data retention discussion in Brazil, three different waves that has shaped the debate in three different formats and paces, respectively a uh, polarized, an uh, intermediate, a more nuanced, and a resigned discussion on data retention. Gradually, the movement of, res of resistance against data protection, uh, data retention legal regime, and the topic itself has lost energy and protagonism in the public debate in Brazil. That's the point that I'd like to make here today. The first wave covers from the first to the third IGF from 2011 to 2013, and at that time there was no legal obligation with regards to data retention in Brazil. The center of the discussion was if the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, Marco Civil the Internet, which was under analysis of the Brazilian Congress, EF, should adopt or not a mandatory clause on data retention. During these three years, from 2011 to 2013, there was strong resistance, resistance on data retention in terms of rejecting a mandatory data retention le legal regime at all, and the main argument was that a preemptive and massive data collection would be not aligned with the constitutional clause of the presumption of innocence, and thereby it would be unconstitutional. Oversimplifying, data retention debate were completely polarized, a binary approach between the adoption or the entire refusal of the mandatory data retention regime. However, we, are, we all know that the final version of the test of Marco Civil has adopted a mandatory data retention legal regime. Inter, inter, internet, internet connection provides are obliged to keep connection legs at connection logs at least for one year, and the internet service providers are obliged to keep access and the user application for six months. And this is the start point for the second wave, for the second stage. From 2014 and, and to 2015, which corresponds to the fourth and the fifth Brazilian IGF, it emerged an uh, intermediary approach. A part of who was totally against a mandatory data retention regime has become partially against a mandatory data retain regime. At that time, the well-known decision that was just mentioned here of the European Court of Justice of invalidating the EU directive data retention has influenced a lot of the debate in Brazil. Taking the rationality of such decision, there should be more safeguards to proportionally regulate metadata retention obligations. For instance, some voice during the Brazilian IGF have claimed that data access should be granted only by a court order issued within the course of criminal inve investigations and not within in the civil proceedings as Marco Civil has prescribed. Access to metadata should be granted only if there would be, if there would not be other preparatory elements and tools, such power should be used as a last resource. Data retention shall only, shall, shall, should be only mandatory for applications hosting content created by users. Only by establishing those safeguards it would be possible to strike a balance between fundamental rights and investigatory powers, and in this sense, the rationality of the decision of the European Court of Justice should inspire the decree of, uh, of regulamentation on Marco Civil the Internet, which was under public dis discussion at that time. Some of its provisions were not full enforceable since they should be more detailed, and this would be a kind of to 
proportionally regulate metadata. But uh, you know that the decree of the of the regulation of Mark Civil the Internet was pretty shine in doing that, which is understandable since the decree has a very limited hole to specify the provisions prescribed in the law and not to amend the law itself. But at the same time, it would be understandable and even predictable that the constitutionality of Mark Civil the Internet could be challenged on this particular point. The first and the second wave shows that the public debate around this issue has emerged and was critically consolidated in the public sphere. And I would say that there were solid arguments that could equip judicial actions to challenge the constitutionality of Mark Civil with regard to its mandatory data retention regime. However, such scenario has not happened, and this is the third and the last phase of the public debate on data retention in Brazil. Why did it not happen? There, three of the well-known for WhatsApp blocking case have occurred right after this period of the second wave, right after the addition of the decree of regulation on Mark Civil the Internet. Obviously, there was an uh, outcry in Brazil that has shifted completely the discussion. During the last two years, from 2016 to 2017, respectively, in the sixth and seventh Brazilian IGF, the debate was focused much more on the protection of the content of communication than the protection of metadata. And to complete, the constitutionality of Mark's view is being right now challenged and it does not address the provisions on data retention. This is the third and the current phase on data protection debate in Brazil, which I would qualify as a resigned. Resigned in a sense that the issue has lost energy and protagonism. There had been a loud silence about this topic in the public debate in general. So to summarize, you can see three states of the public debate on data retention in Brazil, a polarized one, an intermediate one, and a resigned discussion on data retention. Having mapped such a debate, what I'd like to raise as a reflections are, since metadata can provide a very precise portrait of our personalities and could be even more revealing than the content of the communication, do they should not have the same protection? What is interesting about metadata is that it can't lie. I can simulate an email and it, it can be all fake, every single word of it. But the information about where, who, when I sent that mail, that is a factual information. Look for the present, talking into account, taking into account that our lives are very much connected, digitalized, and looking for the future. Internet of, things in, Internet of Things is coming, how much that information could be revealing about us, could be even more revealing than the content of our communication, how we can produce empirical of evidence of how much useful has been metadata to prosecute cybercrimes, speaking more generally. Are the policy debate of balancing fundamental rights and investigatory powers are really advancing and in the correct direction? Would it not be desirable to take some steps back and see what such historical analysis, analysis can tell to us? From the Brazilian perspective, surfing these three waves of data retention policy debate in Brazil would be useful for such purpose. Should we, the, should we do the same, not only nationally, but also re, reg, regionally, in order to feed globally the policy debate of balancing the protection of fund, fundamental rights and investigatory powers? So basically, those are the reflections that I would like to make today. And thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Bruno. This was also a, an excellent uh, reflection, I guess, regarding the discussion in Brazil and the Brazilian IGF. Uh, on data retention, and I think it dialogues a lot with what uh, Marianne said before of uh, government hacking, when she discussed government hacking, and you made a, a very good point about the shift of attention uh, to the content, to the protection of content of communication and the discussion about encryption. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move to the uh, to a final discussion on data literacy. This was a topic that was suggested by, by the youth LAC IGF. And I will um, introduce you to Veronica Arroyo. She's a member of the Youth Ob Observatory and the director of Embajadores de Internet, representing the youth like IGF, and also a co-organizer of the session. Before giving her the floor, I'd like to also thank Carlos Guerrero, 
who is from youth like IGF and he was uh, he couldn't be here but he was also involved in the organization of this session and Sara Frati who is our online moderator today Veronica thank you Jamila uh, thank you everyone who is here um, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and sharing some some thoughts that we have about data literacy I want to share first of all our perspective since from the youth perspective of that that literacy and then I'm, I will go move if I have time briefly I'm going to explain some initiatives that are going on uh, about data literacy and young population uh, for this first part I want to talk about our perspective but I will base on two resources one is our reports from the youth like EGF if, if you don't know what is what is the youth like EGF is an IGF for young people in Latin America we usually do this event one day before the LAC AGF event and uh, we this year we had our second edition so these reports are from the 2016 and 2017 uh, sessions and I will also um, use as a resource um, a survey that we conducted this this month about the data literacy I will start with this um, survey and a little disclaimer here because uh, you might know that we cannot take all the, I mean, all the opinions of all the y young people who are who live in Latin America because it's not kind of possible. But uh, it also it gives us um, great ideas of what is happening and what we really think about in data literacy. So, uh, what what is happening in in our minds? First of all, when we ask what is data literacy, people didn't know what is data literacy. Because the, the word data literacy is not familiar to us. However, when we started to see uh, and we started to explain basically what it means, I mean, this knowledge of data processing and all the empowering of, of this uh, concept, then they say, yes, I understand this idea and I think I can be uh, more aware of this in the future. So there is an idea, even though we don't know exactly the, the word. And that's one point. The second point is when you ask them, okay, so why do you, how do you know this about uh, data processing? And they, ans they, they answer, well, it's because I work on th these issues because a uh, great part of the people who fill out the, the survey uh, have some kind of relation with internet uh, issues. Some of them say, oh, no, it's because I study some engineering or some law things. And, and some of them they said because of curiosity. And it was good to, to read a comment, uh, an answer saying that they started to take aware, be aware about um, data and data processing and all these data protection issues because they were hacked. And since the moment they were hacked, they started to be more aware of this um, problem or this opportunity, or however you, you love to, to call it. And then if we ask the other, uh, we ask it the other part of the group why they do not know about data literacy or how, what is the, the main reason why they are not taking this into account in their daily life? And their answer, I mean, was, I think, the most easy, <laughs> easiest answer. They do not read terms and conditions, and they don't like terms and conditions. It's too big. It's too difficult to read. They don't have time to do that. And that's why they really don't care about data things and data and privacy and all of those uh, things that we have online. And some of them completed saying that they are not interested and they see that it really does not affect them in any way. Um, so when we started in this conversation, then we asked, so this is important, right? Okay, we agree on that. So what can we do to improve this uh, situation or get you know, more people involved in what in knowing what is data processing or data literacy and all of those things. And they say, yes, uh, we can do workshops, we can do some education work. And, but who is the one who we in charge to do this? Uh, well, enterprises, because they are the ones who are taking our data, they are in collecting our data, so those are the ones. And in a second position, they put the government or the state, which is good because <laughs> of what I'm gonna say in, in some minutes. And with this idea, I tried to compare what I got from the reports from 2016 and 2017 sessions. And those reports reveal kind of the same issue. Uh, first of all, they say that, okay, here the ones who are in the room, maybe we know what is data protection, we know what uh, is um, 
what does data processing mean. However, people outside the room maybe do not know, and they do not know because there's too, there, there are not too much information outside, and but they are kind of this. I know, my friends don't know, but we are kind of, you know, asking if maybe they are selling our, da our data or not. So they are kind of aware that maybe there is a transaction or uh, some trade on data. And they, I, when I see the reports, there, there is always some um, ideas, some terms and condition again. So this, this idea um, appears and they say, well, with the, with the issue of terms and condition, we do not read terms and condition, but we are afraid of terms and condition. And when they were asked why you are afraid with terms and condition uh, and these privacy policies of applications and, and pages and all that, web pages, they say because uh, after signing those terms and condition, I, I may, may lose all my privacy or I feel I can lose my privacy. However, I have to sign those terms and condition in order to access that service. And I'm kind of pushed to sign these terms and condition because there's no way. So it's just one way. I just need to, to sign this to get that. I cannot say no to terms and conditions. So that's kind of, uh, they, they know, but they are afraid, but they have to do it. So that's a problem. And when they were asked, what can we do if we have this problem, they also rely on education and on transparency. And when they were asked who can be in charge to do this work, and they also rely on enterprises and put in the second plate of uh, uh, gov um, governments. They say governments need to uh, push or needs to work with enterprises so enterprises can protect our data. But they don't think, I mean, we don't think because I'm that in, in that group, we don't think that governments are also processing data. So that's, a, that's another great point. We see enterprises like Facebook, Google, those big enterprises processing data, but not governments. And I think that's another issue to, to take into account while discussing uh, data and while discussing data literacy. And um, those thoughts for me are very, very important because I see that there's lots of work to do here uh, because we are in a situation of, I, I can say vulnerability in the case because we are pushed to use all the things and all the tools that are in, on internet. However, we are not doing that uh, privacy analysis or anything because um, we don't have another alternative. We're just, we need just to click on the button, I accept and be there. So that's the point. And if we are not even done doing this kind of analysis, how we can go further and ask for data literacy things. So I think that there is a lot of work to do in the young population. Uh, I don't know what, how, what is the situation in other uh, regions, but in the case of Latin America, I think there's a lot of work to do. So in this uh, point, uh, on what can we do? There are some initiatives going on, and I will mention some of them. Uh, two of them are from, two awardees from the 25 under 25 um, mm, program or, well, um, prize of ISOC. One is Kate Green, she is from United Kingdom and she has conducted two programs. One is for high school students called Five Rights Youth Juries and they help um, high school students to um, be part of a jury, a fake jury, about um, internet things and they discuss privacy. And when you see them watch the videos, I invite you to do that, you will see how deep their concerns are about their privacy and they start to do that. Okay. And she also has another privacy hack. I also invite you to, to watch that and to, I mean, to search that on the internet. And the second um, initiative in going on is uh, a Paula's initiative. She's also from the Youth Observatory. She's doing the uh, digital literacy initiatives. M most of the initiatives are called on the title uh, digital literacy, but when you see the content, they are doing data literacy. Um, and yeah, and also another resource for, for you is um, the research of Datos Protegidos, an ONG from Chile that talks about children's perspective on privacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. It was great to hear uh, the perceptions you got from users regarding the imbalance of power or the feeling of an imbalance of power uh, between users and, and companies and also to, to have this feeling that people are not so uh, comfortable as we might think with sharing so much data with uh, these companies or even the government, right? Yeah. 
Uh, I hope we can hear from Paula during the, the discussion session. I uh, will move now to Federica Tortorella, who is representing the IGF Dominican Republic. She will continue the discussion on the Felipe. Thank you, Federica. Thank you so much. Well, I will talk about Dominican Republic uh, perspective about data literacy. The current par uh, practices uh, in this case are very few because data literacy in Dominican Republic is a theme that needs more discussion. It's still something new. Uh, we made a survey to collect some data. Uh, it was answered by 56 people and the 66% of them doesn't know what data literacy is. And the other part of those who answered yes to the question, what do you think data literacy, um, who answered to the question, what li uh, do you think data literacy is, has a misconception of it. In our country, data treatment is ruled by the law 162, published in uh, 2013. Databases of financial institutions are regulated and supervised by a uh, government institution called the Superintendency of Banks. But unfortunately, other databases like, uh, like health, like meteorology, and so on, um, are not regulated. So there is a lack of awareness, too, by the users about what do institutions or companies do with their personal data, which is a very serious, big, uh, which, uh, which is a very serious issue. Managing those databases means having a lot of power, and it must be ruled to keep them safe and secure. By the way, Dominican Republic is making an effort to solve those problems. It, uh, it's working mainly with open government and, for example, databases that deals with transparency, especially in public budgets um, and cash flow, such as payrolls, suppliers, and so on, must be accessible to everybody. So they must be uploaded in different formats like Excel or PDF. In every case, in our country, it is necessary to work hard in data literacy issues. Specifically, more public policies are needed, especially on ICT's adoption. There is a program called uh, Republica Digital, in, in English should be uh, Digital Republic, thank you, which aim is to make a digital revolution happen according to the sustainable development objectives. But unfortunately, it is not enough because of the lack of public policies budget, disaggregated goals, or key performance indicators to measure its advances. Uh, advances. It lacks a transparency visible affecting the follow-up by society, neither a public or a semi-private institution that follows its work or impacting the society. Thank you. Thank you, Federica. Uh, thank you for bringing the, the context of the uh, Dominican Republic. I will now uh, give the floor to Flavia Lefebvre, who is a member of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee and one of the, prom the promoters of the Brazilian IGF, actually. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, from Proteste, that is a consumers association, and I thank uh, Jamila for, uh, for invi inviting us to report and share our efforts uh, to mobilize Brazilian society to make pressure in Parliament to approve a uh, data protection law. Um, as a member of Coalition of Rights in Network and as a representative of Internet Steering Committee in Brazil, uh, I have supported the civil society in addressing sensitive and fundamental issues for internet users to the most stakeholder institutional environment internet governance. The Coalition of Rights in the Network is a collective of organization on fundamental rights, communication and consumer rights, advocacy, activists and academics. It started in June 2015 and since then has gained relevance in the various debates regarding the use and development of the Internet in Brazil. Among the various topics considered as priorities by the coalition is the recognition of the strategic importance of approving a personal data protection law in Brazil. Also, Brazil civil law of the Internet a law uh, that was enacted in 2014 brings us important reference about data 
It is a principle-based law which defined guidelines to the use and development of the internet and therefore does not provide enough degree of details to regulate the collection, treatment, and use of data by enterprises and governments. Further, so far, we have not succeeded in approving a data protection law that reflects the conjunction of forces of the various sectors involved. There is a lot of pressure from companies in lowering the uh, data protection standards or at least not changing the current status quo. Moreover, the civil society lacks awareness of the importance and urgency of the issue due to a false and widespread perception that protecting privacy is not something that is feasible any longer. Such scenario, scenario is very negative uh, as it leaves citizens in a situation of uh, vulnerability, susceptible to harms derived from the digital environment, a problem that will be uh, worsened by the rise of the Internet of Things. People are generally uh, not aware that personal data is the new oil of the world economy and a resource of great commercial and political value. For this reason, we will promote uh, digital literacy, which involves awareness of the importance of protecting personal data and digital rights. People believe that the platforms and application are offered for free, and this has been one of the main barriers in engaging and mobilizing users towards as well as raising awareness for these issues. Most people do not understand the trade-offs involved, such as the large-scale data collection, as well as right infringements, such as algorithm discriminations, violations of the freedom of expression, and freedom of choice. The vast majority of the population is not able to take any measures against abuses uh, in the use of personal data by the private or public sectors, and serious abuses have been occurring on large scale in Brazil. In fact, such law has existed uh, for over 20 years in, in Europe, in Latin America, eight countries have already enacted such rule. So, in an effort to raise awareness for the issue of personal data protection, the coalition developed the campaign named You Are Your Data, uh, launched in October 2017. The campaign uh, depicts different ways through which our personal da data is exploited, revealing sensitive information about our lives. For all these reasons, we urge the international community to support our efforts in getting a data protection law enacted in Brazil. Such support will not only help us protecting rights and avoiding abuses against democratic, uh, democratic safeguards, but would also greatly contribute towards strengthening international commerce and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavia. Thank you uh, for sharing the experience of how civil society can also promote uh, digital literacy initiatives. Uh, I guess we had uh, several interesting interventions uh, from the panel. Um, I would like to open now the the floor for the discussion with you. We are not many, so I think we will have, we, are, we will be able to have a nice uh, debate and conversation about the topics that were discussed here. Uh, does anybody would like to start? Danilo? Thank you, I'm Danilo Doneda from Brazil. I would like directly Bruno Bioni, but also the opinion of the uh, panelists about your opinion on that retention and if that retention has to have the same protection as content, that wouldn't create a problem on 
having trouble to supply law enforcement agents to, with any substantive material to deal with, and also create some problems on the very nature of exchange on communications and internet in, at a technical level. Thank you, Danilo. Uh, Bruno, would you like to? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Well, that's a good question, a <laughs> challenge question. I would say that no, because basically what I tried to, to do here, it was an analysis that the same protection that uh, metadata should have as the content has. Basically, I'm supporting to create the same safeguards, at least the same safeguards to have access to those data. So why not to, you know, to, to try to, to bet and to create like uh, rights of transparency. So in Brazil, we have a, a kind of duty of transparency that the, the wire, wire trapping, the interception of the, the communications should have to uh, an, uh, a report on that showing how, how often uh, was, were, were the, the, the requisitions, the requests for that. And uh, I think you could do the same with the, the metadata. And then at the end of the day, how much is useful metadata to prosecute, to investigate, and to fight against cybercrime? So what I'm trying to, to, to raise here, that at least we should think about the same safeguards. And then I think you can set up a kind of baseline for, for, for this discussion. Mari, would you like to also comment? Um, so in the um, European Union framework, all types of personal data, including metadata who deserve the same protection. Uh, what we see in Europe, it's a very Pinterest uh, environment, unfortunately. So we have uh, two rulings from the European Court of Justice that has made clear several safeguards. And for example, the directive on, on data retention has been declared um, invalid. Um, precisely because um, of the uh, fundamental rights violations. So if you read, um, uh, for example, the, in the Tele2 uh, ruling, it says clearly that a general and indiscriminate retention obligation for crime prevention and other security reasons would not m more be possible at national level than it is at EU level, since it would violate just as much the fundamental requirements as demonstrated by courts' insistence in two judgments delivered in Grand Chamber. So that means that um, and indiscriminate and mass collection is not uh, permitted. The thing is, unfortunately, that uh, EU member states um, are not abiding by these rules. There's a report uh, by Eurojust that was um, published by one of our members of State Watch that shows that there's quite a lot of disparity among member states and they're not actually abiding by the standards of, um, of the court. And this is obviously very challenging. Um, from ETRI, we're uh, trying to make sure that the European Commission takes action. Unfortunately, the European Commission is not showing very much willingness to do such thing, but at least we have clear case law that indicates certain safeguards, um, and this must be uh, abided by, uh, by them, by all uh, EU member states. But obviously, that's the EU situation. Would anybody else like to comment on this one? Uh, do we have another question or comment, please? Yes, thank you very much. I'm Peter Kimpian from Council of Europe. And I have several things um, to react on, um, but I would try to I'll limit myself on three. First and foremost, I was very happy and very glad to participate in this panel and to see all this enthusiasm and all this work that you're carrying out, especially outside of Europe, um, as Council of Europe is mainly focusing in its activities, daily activities to Europe. But I will explain a little bit later, we have great interest what's happening outside of Europe as well. As we think that privacy is a universal global, uh, universal human right, which is global, and which has to be guaranteed everywhere in the world. So I am very happy. Uh, secondly, I, th I, I, um, I would like to draw your attention uh, to uh, the, one of the jurisprudence um, which um, 
maybe not is is not that extensive as the jurisprudence you were referring to in your expose, but it's um, it's more historical and has um, has established, I would say, a very concise framework when it comes to law enforcement access to data, and to which the European Court, uh, the European Union Court of Justice, makes a lot of reference. This court is the European Court of Human rights, which is uh, in Strasbourg, and which is a um, which is a, a, the body of the or, or the or one of the part of the organization of Council of Europe, and which clearly stated in 1978 that access to data for law enforcement purposes represents an interference in individuals' privacy, and it is as such can be judged as a legitimate interest for the preservation of, for the maintenance of peace and, and public order and public security, but it has to be balanced. And this is the key word um, in, in our sense, the balance and how you reach this balance. And the balance, we believe, can be reached um, by dialogue. And you were referring to uh, important um, activities that European institutions, uh, Council of Europe including, are, um, are, um, are, are, are engaged in. Um, but as far as Council of Europe concerned, we will remain always open and we have been in the past uh, to the dialogue. And we truly believe it. Um, therefore, I really encourage you to continue your work, but not only to continue, but make your work um, um, public or make your work uh, channelized through those um, uh, political um, and, and legislative initiatives which is currently going on and which are, which are of really great importance. The, um, the Council of Europe um, um, piece of legislation on a new drafting protocol, on a new protocol to the Budapest Convention is supported by not least 120 um, governments in the world. Um, you see we are living in an environment where terrorist attack happen happens and, um, and data which are in the cyber space can be very useful or very helpful to uh, police um, and you know the, the favorite example of the Bataclan uh, accident where out of the cyber crime investigation, 45 after the accident took place, the, um, the perpetrators um, could be revealed. However, one of the best place to, for this work, we believe, is the Council of Europe. And it's not only we believe, this is 120 uh, uh, governments in the world, including US, Canada, um, Brazil, Argentina, um, um, it believes is we can have this balance uh, approach as we have two uh, legal instruments which are open to third countries one being the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, but one being the Convention 108 on Data Protection. And, 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 those, those, um, and between those uh, conventions and the committee uh, they are working, there are great synergy. And, <clears throat> and we take into account each other's, uh, each other's um, point of view and reflection. So to cut the long story short, we, I'm coming from the Secretariat of Convention 108, which is dealing with data protection. And we have ex ex exactly the same issues in mind and we assess exactly the same topics that you were referring to. But we have a committee which, is con uh, con um, which comprises tw uh, 51 member states but several, um, several observers, such as NGOs. We have NGOs at our meeting, and we are discussing with them, uh, with them on um, on these issues. So, I would really bring 
or, or, or raise the awareness on this possibility that, of course, there are certain criteria to qualify to come to the meetings, but I can uh, give more information on that if you are interested. But we have, like Edre, um, Marian, we have already members uh, with, uh, with whom we are in constant or regular, at least, uh, dialogue. So I would stop by uh, here. Uh, the work has already been started. It is, um, it, it will be very interesting work, but be sure that um, we at Council of Europe, we want to do it on a, on a balanced way. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for your, uh, thank you very much for your intervention and comments. I guess the, the idea of the whole panel was to, to establish this type of connections and dialogue. I don't know if you would like to comment, if any of you would like to comment on yes. some specific yeah, points. Yeah. Just highlight some points. Flavia, then. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, CGIBR is an important space to uh, treat, uh, to, uh, treat about cooperation and uh, research and, and uh, other issues about data protection and the systems, the different systems, uh, data protection in, in other words, in Europe, uh, Europe especially then uh, our door is open and I think it's a good initiative if we can uh, talk about and make uh, changes and uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect, Flavia. Uh, Marian? Marian? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, just, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for, Peter, for making that comment. Uh, I think it's fundamental that uh, civil society, not only from Europe, but across the globe actually engage. Uh, we see when we have heard that there's not much awareness and then I believe that even in within some uh, countries that uh, could potentially sign this uh, second protocol should hear from all civil society voices. Um, so in Italy, we are trying to um, broaden the coalition that we have initiated. Um, uh, if you look at our website, there's a submission that we sent to the Council of Europe, signed by 14 NGOs. Uh, these include uh, NGOs also in Latin America, like Derechos Digitales and TEDIC, but definitely we think that we should work more uh, together. With regards to um, the balance that needs to be achieved, I mean, absolutely, that's what we aim for. And that's why in our submission we called not only civil society to be uh, included, but also like units like yours to be actually actively involved in the cyber and crime discussions because uh, this is not um, uh, well, done in the way that we would like to, but also would like that the, the uh, committee on cyber crime to actually include also people from the registry of the European Court of Human Rights, the Human Rights Directorate, uh, the Data Protection Unit of the Council of Europe, as I said before, also the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and um, any other actors that are relevant uh, to the discussion. And so um, another point that I wanted to make with regards to the combination between the Convention 108 on Data Protection and the Cybercrime Convention, we think that that is fundamental. Ideally, uh, we would have loved for um, uh, for having a requirement that if you are a country and want to sign and ratify the Convention on uh, uh, on Cybercrime, that you actually had to ratify and sign, well, sign and ratify the Convention 108, which actually that's not the case. The most uh, obvious example is the United States, and so we see that uh, these needs to be these two conventions need to go, um, you know, hand by hand. Otherwise, uh, we have a strong. Uh, 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 demands and concerns that are responded to by the Convention on Cybercrime, but then we also need to have protection. And obviously data protection uh, is not the only safeguard, but it's very important that that's actually part of, uh, of the framework of the countries that would potentially uh, adhere to this. Thanks, Marian, great points. Uh, Bruno? Yeah, uh, very qu quickly. Uh, Brazil has no comprehensive personal data protection law, so 
it, I think it would be, it wouldn't not be possible to accede to the Convention 108 without this kind of piece of legislation, without a personal data protection authority, a DPA. So I think that, I mean, the correct pace for Brazil at least should have, firstly, a comprehensive personal data protection to, to accede to the Convention of the Council of Europe on, of, with regards to personal data protection, and after then, uh, okay, the, the Convention of Budapest. Uh, I think this space it would be, you know, a kind of uh, efforts of balancing those competing interests and, and rights. And one thing that the uh, Council of Europe is a, a key uh, player and uh, also the Convention uh, uh, with regards to personal data protection because there is a, a specific provision uh, with regards to cooperation between uh, the, the countries and mainly between the data protection authorities. And uh, I think at the end of the day, the, the problem around personal data protection comes when we try to enforce those guarantees and those rights. And uh, if you can establish this kind of mutual cooperation that have been done before with the Canadian Data Protection Authority and the, the, the Dutch Data Protection Authority, which is one of the leading case in that area. And then if you can have, you know, a broad uh, cooperation pushing by the Convention of the Council of Europe, I think that would be the ideal scenario, definitely. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, I'd like to know if we have a... Uh, ah, bueno, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll give the word to Leah and then to you again. I want to say something to Peter. Panama was the first country in Latin America I did and ratify the Convention of Budapest, but since 2013, I think, it will be impossible to implement the le new legislation about cybercrime in Panama. And one of the main problems is the, uh, that we don't have a lot of protection law and the government is not the hunted the, a lot of not much about this topic and for the first time last October the government called for the NGOs and other cyber society organization in Panama to come to like a discuss to help them to implement it and, and write a perfect or better project of law because this was a big, big problem in Panama and the Council of Europe uh, has been in Panama this year several times trying to help an Armenian government to finally implement this convention. Yeah, and um, as you uh, might know, Brazilian is discussing the, the bill of personal data protection. So I think, uh, you know, from the political perspective for the public debate, I think uh, Council of Europe also could, you know, raise the voice in that sense, because n nowadays the, the political agenda in Brazil is not so much stable. So if you have some kind of support coming from international organizations such as Council of Europe, in a sense that, okay, that's, it's important not only for guaranteeing uh, fundamental rights, but also to, to boost innovative and uh, economic growing. That would be very, very, very useful for us, at least from our perspective of our political agenda. Thank you. I would let Peter answer uh, two minutes, <laughs> and then uh, I'll give you the opportunity. To really in two minutes to respond. Uh, to Marion, um, yes, um, to a certain extent, um, I, I agree with a lot of things you said, but y you also have to be, um, um, you also have to see that the drafting, the first drafting plenary of the additional protocol which took place in Strasbourg and, to, and on which I participated welcomed the, um, the global submission you sent in front of the meeting. So uh, that's, I think that's hope for, uh, for further discussion on this. On Brazil and Panama, yes, we are doing it. We are actually in constant relation with the Brazilian governments, with Brazilian stakeholders, as well as in Panama, and we are promoting both conventions for those countries. But you, 
have to understand, and I think you understand that for 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 a national states, for for a, for a country, it is a political decision to install uh, a data protection authority, which will have repercussion in different <laughs> uh, in different area. So it has to have. To, it has to be a political consensus within the country, and then after we can come, of course, we can help in, uh, in several ways, giving information and, uh, and engaging in activities. We are doing it, especially with Brazil since long time, and we, we are pursuing it, as we already have Argentina, and uh, Mexico has been invited to exceed uh, Convention 108, and those states also helping us in Latin, Latin America doing it. But uh, it's not easy to come. But it is one thing. But the other thing is that it is not only at the, uh, the Council of Europe is not only um, giving space to intergovernmental relations, but to NGOs as well. We have NGOs in our meeting, which I think is detrimental. It's important. Mm -hmm. And we, if you're sending us um, uh, papers, we are reading them and we try to include them in our work. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we have another question or comment here. Um, thank you. It's more yeah, an, a comment or um, invitation, intervention and invitation. Um, my name is Shisol Kumar and I, um, I work at Global Partners Digital, um, which is a civil society organization. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be here earlier um, to hear um, the, the panelists speak on this issue. Um, but I just wanted to highlight an opportunity, an upcoming opportunity, which is the um, International Conference of Data Protection Commissioners, which is the only global convening of data protection authorities in the world um, on this issue. And next year, the, the, with the conference being ho hosted in Brussels, it offers a good opportunity for uh, civil society groups to engage. Um, and there are a group of global civil society groups that have engaged traditionally, um, and we are very keen to open this up and to ensure that as many civil society groups from across um, the world can engage in the upcoming conference in 2018. The outcomes of the conference are non-binding, of course, but it offers an opportunity for a norm building on this issue. It also offers an opportunity to engage with data protection authorities, um, on, on pressing issues in the digital age when it comes to privacy and, and data protection. So if anyone, uh, this is particularly sort of a shout out to civil society stakeholders in this, um, in this session. Um, if you are interested in some of the upcoming opportunities, uh, please do come and talk to me. Um, and I, I can also share with you some printed guides to the ICBPPC um, which outline how it works um, and how you can engage as civil society. So I, I just wanted to put that out there um, as an opportunity to, to engage on this issue at, at the global level. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask our remote moderators if we have any questions, I guess. Um. Uh, I actually received uh, from another channel, but <laughs> I received a remote moderator from um, just a minute. Let me read it. Actually, um, it's good because participation was mentioned, so I, I think it's a good time to put this. Um, Diego is asking, um, consider that data retention, oh, sorry, not that one. Uh, um, Oh yes, this one. Considering that data retention has several economic implications and business and civil society have different capacities to influence public policies around the matter, what could be a common approach to enable a solid participation of so uh, civil society in policy processes? Excellent, very appropriate. Uh, does anybody want to comment? Yes, Veronica? Yeah, data retention is another difficult word for everyone. <laughs> Uh, as I was mentioning before, if we have the same problem with data literacy, that's happening also with data retention. I mean, uh, if we are going to tackle this issue, uh, if we want to society to participate on this uh, process, on the process uh, where we decide things or where the government decides things or uh, try to implement some laws or, or that's not, I think one of the basic things that we have to do is to put this, um, that's a retention implication in, in, in easy words. 
this is from our uh, data literacy perspective. But I think that um, that's one of the points in, um, I mean, I don't know if that helps you to understand the literature. Oh yes, probably it will help Diego asking the question, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have more comments uh, here, otherwise I will give the participants the opportunity to make their final remarks. Uh, does anybody want to make another question or comment? Well, so, Leah, would you like to start? Um, since my organization in Panda Tech and other organizations in Latin America, we are working in a report about the data protection situation in our countries and the several trying to implement the Budapest Convention, so maybe will be a good opportunity for Peter and other interested in this topic in this room to read about that in Latin America, in Mexico, Colombia, Paraguay, Chile, and Panama. And maybe the report will be online in next March, depend the, so it's just a commercial ad. Well, thanks a lot also to Jamila for the moderation and to everybody for sharing your experiences. It was very nice. Um, just some final uh, remarks. So it's very interesting to know that uh, also what the European Union does uh, has repercussions uh, across the globe. We're trying to make this point in Brussels uh, that it's not just important to make sure that fundamental rights are respected um, into lo in law, but also um, it's important to also know that other countries are looking. Um, another point that um, I think is a to take um, uh, something to take home is that enforceability is very important. So just for the fact that there must be a framework or a rules, that doesn't mean that data protection, privacy, and any other right actually are respected. This uh, having a framework is the first step, but definitely not the end of the conversation. Um, the third point is that we need evidence-based policy making. Um, this is very key. With regards to data literacy, absolutely, that's very important. Uh, in EDRI, for example, we have developed an initiative called the um, Your Guide to Digital Defenders. So it's a booklet uh, for um, kids, but also for young people uh, to teach basics uh, about privacy. And we would love to have more cooperation with, with our NGOs on that. Um, another take, uh, something to take home, uh, it's that we need to move from vulnerability to empowerment. Uh, we think that there's nothing to fear um, in the future if we have a strong protection for our rights and a strong defense of our rights from all parties. Uh, we think that um, uh, we're stronger if we work together uh, and definitely that's, that's not limited to, for example, the coalition of NGOs that EDRI represents, but also um, across the globe and regions. Um, so we're very happy that this session is taking place because that shows that uh, new opportunities can actually take place. Uh, just thank you again. And uh, I'd like to highlight the, um, the political importance of the, the data protection, uh, especially now that in Brazil uh, we will hold presidential, presidential election in 2018 and the electoral campaign raises several concerns such as the ones related to abusive uses of personal da data and the spread of false information. Thus, working on digital literacy is one of our priorities as well as educating the population of the potential democratic harms related to the measures of personal data. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Flavia, uh, Bruno? Yeah, the, the question that was made from Diego, I think, I don't know, uh, in terms of uh, capabilities of doing law and pressure in the debate of data retention, and I would I, and I would say also in the debate of the cryptography, I think you, you can establish some parallels in a sense that at least from the Brazilian perspective, 
the civil society wasn't that strong to put safeguards and provide safeguards in the in the test of Marco Civil. It was uh, uh, you know it was a dispute that the civil society and the, I would say also acad the academia has lost. When Dilma wa was approving the, the Marco Civil of, of the Internet in the Net Mundial, some activists uh, has raised some flags asking for Dilma to reject the provisions on data retention. And uh, right now, we don't have uh, a kind of uh, empirical evidence to know better how is being useful those kinds of, uh, you know, investigatory powers to persecute and to investigate uh, those kind of crimes. And then if you can, you know, create a kind of a baseline and, uh, you know, uh, evidence policy making on that, then I think we are much more able to move forward and to discuss, for instance, the, the, the public debate on cryptography. In a sense that uh, sometimes we are thinking that you are cutting the, the skin, but actually we are cutting, you know, the, the fat. In a sense, for balancing the fundamental of rights, I think first of all, and uh, I would say globally, we have to, to, to re-debate and uh, discuss again that retention regime in, in, a, in a sense that you should uh, push the agenda to provide more concrete safegu safeguards and uh, at the end of the day, the key word of balancing the fundamental rights against to investigatory powers. Then I think uh, it would be much more clear how is going this policy agenda in general. So basically wh what I've tried to, to do here using the, the Brazilian experience and the Brazilian debate was to map this whole debate to, sh to just make clear uh, a point. You should finish uh, some uh, kind of discussions that you have been uh, involved in the past and use these same arguments, reuse the arguments that were made there to now. I think the, the debate of the cryptography, uh, if you should push, put back doors, you know, uh, put weakness on cryptography, just could be made if you are much more uh, aware of, uh, what, of uh, how much is being useful data retention and metadata in general to prosecute and investigate uh, cyber crimes. I would say that. Thank you, Bruno. Veronica? Okay, um, uh, I want to thank you, everyone here in the, um, because in the panel, because they, I really appreciate all the, all, all the knowledge and all these ideas on on data and data, data retention, and because as 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 I've mentioned before, uh, Latin America is going to have many elect electoral processes this year or the following year, I mean, 2018 and 2019, and yeah, it's it's pretty it's, it's pretty amazing. But in in the side of when when we talk about data literacy, just my ha my final thoughts are that uh, we should ask uh, policymakers to, to, to work on data literacy and to have data literacy in their agenda. Why? Because I agree with Marianne that um, we need to eliminate that fear that we have, that the young generation, ha um, generation has right now. And to build a secure internet where our rights can be protected, can be, um, you know, you, you can uh, navigate on safer on on internet and you know that there, there is no harm there and because data literacy is, is not just to be to acknowledge about your your data protection and about your data and what people do with your data and what companies um, do with your data but it's also to empower you to to participate on policy decision uh, processes and to be to be part of that um, of, of that environment as, um, and I think that that is another step, not just the knowledge, but just, but the, and the other steps is, is to take actions. And in, if we talk in, in the perspective of young people, um, this is very important because now we are users, but one day we're gonna be there sitting and taking decisions. So I think a step by step we can uh, have that. Uh, thank you, that's all. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, do you want to follow up? Well, uh, it was very interesting to share with you our opinions and mainly in the Dominican Republic there are a lot of challenges and I think in Latin America and Caribbean too. 
uh, to have the laws and rules needed for data protection and to keep awareness about data literacy. The users must know how do they data, do the information are uh, used because this is a power that institutions and organizations have. And as a final user, so I have the right to know what do they do with that. And also the, those institutions and companies or whatever need to know how uh, to work uh, with transparency to, to that. So I will thank you again, all of you, because I think this kind of sessions are not only to, to speak about what, uh, what is um, happening in our country, but also we learn more about what uh, the, ten uh, the tendency, the trends uh, in all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica, and thank you all for joining us in this session, one of the last IGF sessions. Thank you for surviving until here. <laughs> and uh, let's continue the dialogue in a more informal way now. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.